Greetings. Welcome to The Headhunter with me, Lab and Cliff, coming to you from Coffee City, Africa. Always a pleasure to have you on board uh, to another yet exciting episode. Again, we'll still continue to appreciate your feedback that we continue to receive. I must say, singling out LinkedIn because I think there are lots of uh, inboxes uh, that I've personally received from uh, ardent watches of the headhunter how the show has actually developed you to actually stay ahead um, what you've actually realized as well is that there's also a keen interest from you know job seekers or people who want to move jobs or maybe want to even come back uh, to work in Kenya or East Africa and maybe they're in the diaspora so thank you so much for that feedback it's quite interesting I think as the headhunter will really try and strive to make sure that you can actually meet these professionals that we continue to interview um, every week and of course bring you the latest on the matters to do with people development HR skills and just really how to stay ahead and become top talent so that you can be headhunted. Well, today we have another exciting guest and I'm already glad to introduce you Mr. Frank Mola, who's a payment technology expert. I must say a chip from the Mola family. He'll tell us more about himself, uh, his brother, what he does as well, and his family as well. So uh, over to you, Frank. Karibu sana to the headhunter. Asante sana and thank you for having me as well. Um, what's interesting to note, I think some people were discussing earlier, it's your first time at Kofisi. Correct. Isn't it interesting that our post-COVID era we're seeing a rise in you know, such beautiful spaces and at the point where we're seeing a drop in you know, office occupancies, people are preferring to go into these co-working spaces. What do you think about that? I mean, it's, it happens. I remember um, you know, when I was in MasterCard, I've since transitioned, mm. and uh, we went to, I think, Sunland Building. Yeah. There was more or less the same setting. Yeah. And you see post that, you're right. Um, you find this more calm, yeah. relaxing, you have your space, but still you can achieve what you want to achieve. Occasionally, yes, going back to the office, it's exciting because you need to bond with your colleagues. But most of the time, what you realize is happening is people are finding some sort of peaceful place to work and you're able to achieve a lot because you're just by yourself. And the environment, if you look at this place, and it's, it's serene, it's really nice. Okay. Yeah. And maybe you can get out the creative juices and Correct. give the best of people. You think, well. you innovate. It's a really yeah. beautiful place, yeah. Right. More reason why the headhunter is hosted here, and of course, we appreciate Coffee City Africa as well. But anyway, um, still, now that we're in a beautiful space, I think we can get a lot of great stories uh, of your career journey as well. So um, I think if you say, or actually in the payment space and having worked on MasterCard, such as multinationals as well, just take us through how your career has spanned into that whole area and spectrum. It's a very interesting story, I must say. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I call it inspirational um, because I've been in the payments for 18 years now, for the last 18 years. But before I go to payments, uh, believe it or not, I mean, being born in a family of seven, um, the third child, I don't know if you know a place called Karibangi South. Yes. K sure. South. Yeah, oh, K South, indeed, <laughs> yeah. That's where we were born, right? And immediately after Form 4, um, your dad is like, young man, uh, please, uh, you're the third one. <clears throat> we have to take care of the rest, so you need to take up your own life. So I didn't get a chance to go to the university, so to speak, because I had to give room for the rest also to, you know, to come out and through the basic education. Um, I did a lot of odd jobs in between. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a driver, a matatu driver, a truck driver. Uh, I was a DJ at some point, I was a radio presenter at some point. Yeah. I did events uh, with the likes of Susan Owe, Oprezo, yeah. uh, Nameless, Tattoos, all these people. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, all that phase, I was trying to discover myself, right? I was trying to understand who is Frank and what is out there for me, you know, and how do I come out from Karibangi South? You know, one of the things I appreciate my dad for is I went to Aga Khan High School. Mm -hmm. But that was after going to a number of schools before that. And that's where I think I got some sort of exposure. Um, getting to go to school with just different, diverse people, mm -hmm. you know. And I remember my dad telling you, I've taken you to that school to grow and to socialize, not so much to pass exams. Because mm -hmm. he had already felt like, you know, dude, you just like socializing too much. So that was a bit of my early days, which I really had to grapple. At some point, I was a mechanic. The exciting part was when I was a Matatu driver, number 15, the most exciting part, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I like it's not all corporate. I mean, it has a place to actually start, like ground up, basically. Correct. Yeah. Uh, 
but I think one thing is I was very, very deliberate about what I wanted because living in Karibangi South and then there was Westlands where I went to school, I saw two different lives. Because I would go to my friends and I'm asking, how are you guys just two kids but you're living in a five bedroom house? And yeah. It doesn't make sense yeah. to me. We are seven in a two bedroom, you know. Mm -hmm. But that gave me some sort of inspiration. And I said, wow, it's possible, right? So I, I did all these odd jobs trying to you know, navigate through. And then eventually what happened is I asked myself, is this a career? I don't have a career path. And that's when I identified there's a difference between a job and a career. So finally, I got myself into Smith Klein Beecham, uh, now Glaxo Smith Klein, yeah. uh, where I was as a casual, uh, doing night shifts, you know, some salary of around 6,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And for me, I felt this was good. There was a lady called Winnie Manyara, God rest her soul, I mean, she passed on. She was my mentor. She took me up at that tender age, you know, and said, you know, Frank, I've had your story. I would want to be your mentor. So my mentorship started long ago before I knew what mentorship was or even what coaching was. So Winnie guided me very well uh, from Smith Klein Beecham, from casual. Um, and then I went to Equity Bank, where Dr. Mwangi is the one who interviewed me. And is that a time when they were just transitioning from the housing? I, to yes. The, so I to, joined to the Equity Bank, bank when it was a building society. Yes, yes. So I was a cashier yeah. for around one and a half years. And I remember Dr. Mwangi was the one who interviewed me, you know, and you could feel the inspiration and the vision when he speaks then, which mm -hmm. hasn't really changed so much from now. Yeah. Again, interacting with him then, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. there is something about Dr. Mwangi that I also felt I might be part of that journey. So I did equity one and a half years as a cashier. And then <clears throat> I made a career suicide at some point. Somebody told me Dubai was happening. So off I went to Dubai. Why do you call this career suicide? I mean, that's a... <laughs> If your dad would take you to Aga Khan to actually get that diversity and that, you know, different feel and experience, going to Dubai should be something that you must have, you know. So you're right. Now, the, the two sides. Oh, it depends it. on the job you actually went Correctly. to. Correctly. Okay. So I didn't go for a job. Okay. That's what saying it was a career suicide. Yes. Because yes. I left equity and some of my friends, that's the time I was getting into entertainment. And we are doing all these gigs. And if you remember Fagilia to a Mr. Nice back then, you know, we were doing all these gigs bringing TID, bringing Mr. Nice, you know, and it seemed like it was quick money and, you know, compared to maybe what I was having before. But then I realized entertainment was short-lived. It's a yo-yo. You. you invest so much by the returns, you don't really get to see anything. So that's when I made a decision now to go to Dubai. And Dubai, man, I did almost 60 interviews. It's amazing. But the jobs I would get is either a waiter, um, a butler, security, and I told myself, nah, that's this, not is not, me. this is not me. <laughs> okay. So I made a decision to come back. So how did you transition now into the corporate, like particularly now moving forward in events, but how did you just that connect? Yeah, so when I came back, um, a friend of mine told me Barclays, now ABSA was hiring. And I said, okay, sounds, sounds exciting. And he said, uh, it's a manager role. Man, I put on my best suit went for the interview the next day. This was just three days after I came back from Dubai. Just to get there, I'm being told there's no manager role. It's actually a direct sales representative role and your starting salary is 15,000. I was already there, I don't have a job. I said, I'm gonna take it. So that's how I got into corporate. And when I started in Barclays, that's when I realized, wait a minute, I think I want a career in banking, maybe technology payments, but I didn't know how it's going to span out. Yeah. But that's when I realized there's a difference between a job and a career. Because for me, a job is something I would pretty much do because I want to earn, I need some money. So you can do any job to earn. But a career is something where you're, you're working, you're building your experience, then money now starts chasing you, there's a difference. What did you learn from there that, that you actually applied that gave you an edge for you to be recruited at MX okay. and MasterCard? So, <sighs> resilience patience, um, ability for you to demonstrate that you can do more than what you're given, Adili ability for you to show that you can be multi-talented. Most of the time what I see uh, happening now is you're employed, you're given your contract. You're the best performing within the confines of your contract. 
people complain that why am I not being promoted? But what you're forgetting is you're just doing as per your contract. Now you need to go outside of that contract for you to demonstrate different abilities, right? If you're just doing what you're employed for, you really don't get promotions because you're already rewarded as per your contract terms. But if you go beyond, then it's easy for leaders to see you and say, oh, wait a minute. Frank is doing this, but he can also take care of this, which is not within. So for me, in those formative stages, the fact that I was able to juggle so much told me that as much as I can do this, I can stretch myself beyond. And it really made it easier for me when, you know, I joined um, Barclays then because I was very flexible. I'm being told to sell cards, but I could sell loans and other things. And now building up as well to American Express. That's a tidbit to all those uh, LinkedIn folks who are inboxing and saying, hey, how do I stay ahead? <laughs> right. um, and especially the guys who are pretty much in the entry level. Right. It'll be nice to have that advice to actually know that don't really be fixated on no. one. Just try and make sure you can get a feel of the different areas of business. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, so there's, there's, there's another twist that also add to it. You know, I never got the privilege to go to uni. Yeah. And today I haven't. Hang <laughs> <laughs> on to that thought because we're just taking a quick break. Right. And one would wonder, I said, oh my goodness, wait, you need to go to university to actually get this role, but you're saying something different. Right. Stay tuned with the headhunter, we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Headhunter with me, Lab and Cliff. Well, just before we went for the break, something that if you told uh, anyone, especially right now when we're having a whole contention about university degrees, uh, this will actually be breaking news that Frank Moller did not go to university. Now, if he was running for governor in Nairobi, <laughs> that would have been really crazy, right? Especially <laughs> at this point in time. We know the story out there, but we're not going to it. <laughs> right. So, and then you... You not go to uni, right. but that did not limit you into your corporate success. No, it didn't. I think what I also learned in that journey is I've seen a lot of people who didn't go to uni are more hungry mm -hmm. than guys who went to the uni mm -hmm. because I find we have a lot that we want to prove at some point. And for me, it was not by choice. If I had a chance, I would have gone to university. You know, but it's a fact that after high school, you're seven kids and your father has to take care of, I'm the third, so the other four, right? So you have to give space. And that's why you say I had to do all these odd jobs, like I mentioned. But it never deterred me, right? So I did Barclays, uh, where it was a five-year contract, like I said. Um, and also joining equity, like I said, Dr. Mwangi gave me a, a lifeline as well. But for Barclays, you could not be a permanent uh, employee without a degree then. So I said, it's fine, I'm gonna do the contract job. So, <clears throat> but what I realized is as I was growing through the ladder, um, I need some certain skills. And what did I do? I thought of lean learning, I call it lean learning, where I do a course that I apply to what I'm doing immediately, and I quickly enroll to Strathmore executive courses. So the first course I did with Strathmore was a master negotiator because I felt that's my line, um, negotiation, sales, etc. And then I later came and did a second course with Strathmore, which was senior management leadership program because now I was getting into leadership courses and all. I later came and I met a friend who went to Harvard. Now this is a juicy part. And he told me, why don't you apply? Wow. I applied and I forgot about it. Yeah. Three months later, I checked my inbox, accepted. You're like, hey, please come. <laughs> like, you know, and that was a good turning point yeah, for me, yeah. you know. Uh, and then, so since then, uh, I've just been doing all these lean courses, um, which have been very impactful to what I do every day. So every time I change my career, yeah. I have to enroll to a course that is going to impact me and apply immediately. 
So sometimes the difference I find between lean learning and the degree is what I learned for four years, when I get into employment, I'll not be able to apply it. But I think it's a good one as a base to start. To start as well. Right. You know what I call it? It's the fire in the belly because I feel like there's a bit of comfort you know, with that degree, with that master's, with that professional paper. So I think I could see that even as you're explaining it, like that is what really put you... Um, Interesting is in, in Barclays, yeah. I had a few people who resigned uh, when they realized I didn't have a degree and one had a master's and a PhD. Mm -hmm. They're like, I can't be led by somebody who's not going to school. Yeah. And that happened. But life is interesting. Later in life, you meet and the same people are coming back and saying, do you have some openings where yeah, you are? Employer, yeah, so, some jobs as yeah, well. It should not define where you're going. Let's look at what your expertise in, and this is in the payment space. Um, there's, I, I don't know what to call it. I mean, I think what COVID has taught us in looking at technology, I mean, for instance, we and so we, my family, like would just order stuff online and, you know, make payments via card, have it delivered to your doorstep, different from just going into the shop and making sure that you can, you know, pay and, and stuff. And of course, this part of the world, thank God for M-Pesa, you have that opportunity to actually do those um, you know, payments. So what, what, what are we learning in this space? Oh, uh, wow, interesting. So I think when I was in MasterCard, that was five years, uh, which MasterCard is a payments company. Yeah. It's a technology company in the payment space. Uh, and I left just, I think, before COVID. But now the company I'm with now, BPC Banking Payments and Commerce, I'm leading the business in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. We are the heart of technology. Mm -hmm. And what I've come to learn is when you think of technology, it has so much advanced, but the human psychology has remained the same. Yeah. Right? Why do I say that? COVID happened. Mm -hmm. All of us thought it's CIOs who are going to change the digital narrative, yeah. but COVID changed that narrative for us. Mm -hmm. And everybody had to think on their feet, what do I need to do? Banks never thought they could work remotely, but now they have to. We had things like Teams, Zoom, Skype. We had these tools before, but we were not using them, Yeah. right? Then all of a sudden, everybody has moved towards the direction of being digital and online. What does that tell you? It tells you that what I've seen in this space is a lot of C-suits make decisions to buy equipment or system or technology that they're not using. Because why were you not using Zoom before? Why were we not using Teams before, right? But now come COVID, we realize actually we can use this tool. So they started coming out, right? So now we've seen CIOs coming up and saying, hey, in COVID time, we saw a rise of fintechs. Mm -hmm. A lot of fintechs came up and they're disrupting, mm -hmm. literally eating the lunch of a lot of financial institutions. Now what you're seeing a lot of banks are doing is they're creating their own innovation centers. They're creating their own sub fintechs to be able to counter, uh, you know, the fintechs that have really morphed from different areas. But what we are also seeing is in this phase, as we transition out of COVID, collaborations remain a key factor. Collaboration between who? Fintechs. The payment, okay, the fintechs payments. and the payments, yes. So let's so, talk so. about regulator, yeah. payment enablers, financial institutions. It's time for us to think of collaboration when you think of Would technology. Would you say the regulation has been more reactive, especially as technology has been <laughs> quite ahead and then now regulation is catching up? Always yeah. the regulator yes. is behind of innovation. This is yeah. always. Yeah. Because what happens is you have, for, for a bank, mm -hmm. they always have to go to the regulator for what yeah. you call an objection yes. when they want to launch any yeah. product. So, but what we've seen post-COVID is some regulators are coming and saying, we want to collaborate with you. We want to co-create value with you so that we walk with you through this journey. Okay. And that's why we are saying then let's not call them regulators. Let's call them moderators mm -hmm. because regulators sound like I'm going to cane you if you don't do something right. Yeah. Yeah. But let me now be called a moderator because mm -hmm. I'm moderating all of you in the industry, but at the same time, I want to co-create value with yourself. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I think government is watching. Um, <laughs> and I think in that space as well, um, you know, various um, entities are all involved. Um, and it will be quite interesting to see how things pan out as we, as we go along. So the narrative of digital, the narrative of um, technology, it's a whole ecosystem play. It needs a regulator. It needs a financial institutions. It needs a payment enablers. It needs everyone in that space 
to see how to move forward together. And that way we are going to achieve financial inclusion in terms of competing with cash. Because competition should not be, mm -hmm. I'm competing with MasterCard, I'm competing with Visa, I'm competing with this PSP. No, but it should be cash because right. cash is still out there in plenty. Mm -hmm. If we digitize it, the cake is so big for all of us. Oh, wow. Great. What does success look, up, look like for you? Success, to me, I've always said it's a journey. <clears throat> it's never a destination. It's a journey. Uh, once upon a time, I thought, moving from Karimangi South to Imara Daima, to me, that was success. So it's a milestone. You realize, even from a salary perspective, when you get a job today and you're told your salary is 30000 and it's your first job, you'll celebrate it. After some time, you're like, no, I want more. So for me, success is a journey. It's not so much a destination where that is where I'm going. And when I get there, I'll be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Each and every time you get to that point, you have to define success differently again. Mm -hmm. Now, that is from a career perspective. But also there are people on the social side. You know, you can pack it career, social, spiritual, physical, depending on education. To me, success would be when I do Harvard, I'm successful in that line of education. So I find success to be personal, but also I look at it like it's milestones, because every time you get to the point you want to be, there's still something else you need to, to move next to. So it's, it's a personal conversation. To me, it's a journey that I keep on walking. Now, it's going to be interesting. So looking at your journey, looking at you being right at the ed edge of technology, seeing how things are going uh, you know, globally and, of course, locally as well, how can talent, how can one stay ahead? Because maybe what you used to know, what, a year, two years ago, is irrelevant now, you know? So trying to merge talent with the technology transitions, what would you say? Um, lean learning, like I told you earlier. Uh, like with technology, it's evolving every day. Fraudsters keep on waking up every day as well. Uh, again, in BPC, we have this anatomy of the new fraudster. Mm -hmm. Why do we call it anatomy of the new fraudster? Mm -hmm is because it keeps evolving every yeah. other day and you have to keep up with the trends so that you're able to navigate through that. But also at the same time, all work without play. I mean, the old narrative is makes Jala dull boy. So you need also some, something to distract you a bit from your daily routine. And for me, my distraction here is a part of my marumba dance instructor. Oh. <laughs> If you not find me in the payment space, um, maybe conferences in different countries, mm -hmm. possibly I'd be somewhere at uh, Serena Impala, even though they've closed mm -hmm. now, or mm -hmm. Parkland Sports Club, yeah. training rumba dance. Yeah. And that's my getaway. A way to just rejuvenate. To rejuvenate. I also play yeah. the sax as well. Uh -huh. um, so once in a while, if you have a birthday, I'll just charge you to 50K, then I... Wow. Can, uh, no better than amount. The <laughs> boss is watching. We need a salary increase as well at this point. <laughs> so those but are it's my... quite important. It's quite interesting to actually get you know, corporate executives such as yourselves just trying to get um, you know, something to actually plug in and to help them. Honestly yeah. speaking, it's important because yeah. at the end of the day, you're human. Yeah. Um, what I've picked through this interview, if you've not asked me, what's your role yeah. or what's your position? Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah, because <laughs> we've, hum we've humanized this. Yes, yes. Because Frank Moller yes. and my role are yeah. two different people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I cannot define myself with my role. Yes. But I can easily define myself with maybe my family, with what I'm doing, and you know something different. Sure. After you leave your organization, mm -hmm. who are you? I don't want to be called. Oh, you don't remember Frank from of Mastercard or mm -hmm. Frank of BPC or Frank of American Express or Equity? No. Yeah. I just need you to refer to me as oh, that's Frank. And that's why for me, I, I always focus on building brand Frank, because Frank and my employer are two different people. And I think at the same time, I stopped saying I work for, I say I work with. Yeah. Because there's value that I bring, mm -hmm. and there's value they've seen, and yeah. they're paying for that value, and I'm being rewarded for that skill. Okay. So that's pretty much how I look at it. And maybe if I add on something is, I tend to see as we grow in our careers, uh, you get to a CEO level or an MD level, right? It's always okay if you find it a bit tough. You can always still come down and start afresh and still go up. Don't get fixated here. Mm -hmm. It's fine to take a few steps back sure. and then start your journey again.
Super. I know we are pressed for time and our producer tells me we have to wrap it up by top three qualities or top three aspects you'll actually look at for somebody you're going to headhunt. Wow, good surprise. Um, Let's go. <laughs> top of, I mean, top of the mind. Yes. One is you, you need to, uh, agility. agility. Agility is one. Two. Number two is um, you, you must be fun. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. You, you must yeah. be somebody who loves fun. Yes. You know, enjoying fun in all yes. yourself. And then I think the last one is authentic. I like. Yeah. Agility, fun, and just authentic. Yeah. Adding on to your list. Thank you very much, Frank. Appreciate it. Thank you for being on the Headhunter. And uh, yeah, I think <laughs> there's a lot more to talk about, I'm sure, but we'll definitely have you on board as well and get, get, get to share your insights as well. That has been none other than Frank Muller, who's a permanent technology expert as well, just trying to transition and take things a little different and look at talent and now how do you really stay ahead and also speaking a lot more on the technology space, especially at this point in time when we're seeing a surge in that um, area as well. As always, we appreciate your feedback and thank you very much to our host for making this happen. On behalf of the entire team working hard behind the scenes to make this happen, it's goodbye for now. Don't forget, see you next week.